many as I'm Metro Board Vice Chair Lucinda Babers, and I represent the District of Columbia on the Metro Board of Directors. With me tonight is my DC Board colleague, Dr. Tracy Lau. I am also joined this evening by Metro's Chief Financial Officer, Yatunde Olamide, and Jennifer Ellison, Metro's Board Corporate Secretary. Welcome to this public hearing on Metro's proposed FY24 budget and capital improvement team. This hearing is convened by the Metro Board of Directors to gather public comments on two dockets. Docket B23-01, Metro's proposed FY2023 through 2028 capital improvement program, and docket B23-02, Metro's proposed FY 2024 operating budget and associated fare and service proposals. Notice of this hearing was made by publication in the Washington Post and ads were placed in the Afro, Atrif, Dene, El Tiempo Latino, the Upper Times, the Korean Times, and the Washington Hispanic, as well as through social media and radio. Signs were also placed in all rail stations, on buses, metro access vehicles, and at select metro bus stops. Notice was also made online and sent to area libraries. We're looking forward to hearing from everyone who's joined us this evening to provide testimony. Now we'll be taking testimony three different ways this evening, in person, via video, and via phone. Before we take testimony, I'm going to ask Metro staff to give us a brief overview of Metro's proposed budget and what's in it. We'll begin with a brief budget video and then a presentation from our CFO. Please play the video. Hi everyone, I'm Randy Clark and I have the privilege of being the Metro General Manager. I'm excited to present our fiscal year 24 budget. Budgets are really about the values and priorities of an organization. And in this organization, delivering safe, frequent, reliable transportation is what we do. And our goal is to do it in the most equitable, sustainable way possible. I'm really proud of the effort the team has made in taking input in the budget process between a lot of customer engagement events, out at stations and at bus stops, working internally with our teams and employee town halls. We met with a lot of elected officials and key stakeholders. Your input helped drive this process and we thank you for that. I want to also recognize our board. We've transparently had multiple board meetings talking about different concepts and investments in this budget and their input has been taken into account. I really look forward to them having a deep review and their consideration of moving the budget process forward. Thank you again for all of your input into Metro's budget and we look forward to seeing you on board the system. Have a great day. We take this process very seriously. And in fact, we've already used some of the feedback that we've gotten from customers, community, the region, and our stakeholders to make some improvements and, in, and start some initiatives that address customer concerns. But the work doesn't stop there. Every penny in this new budget proposal will go towards making Metro service better. In fact, whether it's the low income fare program, the wayfinding signage program, or training for frontline employees, all of our dollars in this budget proposal are being invested in making your Metro better. We're building a new Metro integrated command and communication center to improve coordination between bus and rail incidents. We're also centralizing training and building a training academy designed to create a collaborative environment and promote facility enhanced safety, improve internal coordination, and better communicate with our customers when incidents disrupt service. We've included operational initiatives and capital projects to provide more frequent and reliable bus and rail service, as well as simplified fares to improve our customer access to destination and opportunities. And we've included capital investments to advance sustainability, including this solar carport at Anacostia 
which will generate an energy equivalent to that needed to power about 165 homes for a year. We're focused on increasing our public safety efforts, which means more police and more visibility on Metro bus and Metro rail. We're hiring crisis intervention coordinators to make sure that people with mental health issues get the resources they need. We're also enhancing our video system, which includes thousands of cameras to help us quickly solve crimes and address disorder. We're working to improve our bus and rail system daily. Our focus remains on optimizing bus routes and increasing rail frequency. We're working to build our bench strength through recruitment and retention of Metro bus and Metro rail team members, which will support providing more reliable service to our region. We've increased 7K trains to ease crowding, and we also have extended the Silver Line to the Washington Dallas International Airport by way of Ashburn. This budget proposal includes service improvements on the yellow, green, and orange lines, and also adds three new bus service enhancements to your Metro. The team is working hard every day for our customers, and this budget further supports providing better service to the people who need us most. Our frontline maintenance professionals and our contractor partners are working day and night, 365 days a year, to ensure our tracks, powers, and signals continue to provide the safe and reliable service that our community deserves. Also, we continue to invest in our fleet to include new buses and trains and our Metro Access vehicles. We are also building new facilities and supporting infrastructure that will help in the fight with climate change. Metro's Northern and Bladesburg bus garages will be LEED certified electric bus facilities featuring solar panels, energy efficiency technologies and other sustainable solutions. We build talented teams at Metro. We are looking to recruit the best of the best and provide a workplace culture that is showing our employees that they are valued, supported, and make them proud of their accomplishments and contributions towards making Metro a connector of our region. The proposed FY24 budget is a great opportunity to provide more frequent service to customers, simpler fares, accessibility to transit through a Metro-led low-income fare program, safety, a state of good repair by responsible oversight of our system, and modernization and electrification of our vehicle fleet. While we are fortunate to have a number of funding sources for FY24, FY25 will present some long-term operational outlook challenges that will require more serious discussion about what our region wants Metro to be for our future. Well, I hope you enjoyed the highlights of our fiscal year 24 budget, but the job's not done. We still need to hear more from you, our customers and our community. So please attend or listen in to upcoming board hearings Follow us on social media or wmata.com. Please let us know if we got your priorities right for investing in the future of Metro. It's your community's transit system, and we need your input. Thank you. Enjoy your day, and we'll see you on board. Good evening, board members, Davis and Lewis and members of the public. My name is Yetunde Olumide. I'm the Chief Financial Officer and Executive Vice President here at the Washington Metro. This evening, I'll share with you an overview of the GM's FY24 proposed budget to include highlights, budget initiatives, service and fair optimization proposals, and the proposed operating and capital budget. The proposed operating budget increases bus and rail service, simplifies fares, launches the Better Bus Network redesign, and funds crisis intervention specialists. The proposed capital budget funds zero emission buses and electrification of the Northern and Bladensburg bus garages, opens the new Potomac Yard station, modernizes customer wayfinding, and funds the creation of Metro's integrated communication center. Specifically, the proposed budget increases service frequency with trains every three to six minutes at stations in the core 
and trains every 8 to 12 minutes or better system-wide, benefiting customers across the entire network. On now. There you go. Okay. I'll now present the fare and service optimization proposals. The FY24 service optimization proposal strengthens Metro's transit network by increasing frequency within the central portion of the system to serve fast growing areas with high ridership potential, providing efficient and predictable transfers and increasing job accessibility. The FY24 fare optimization proposal simplifies the Metro Rail fare structure for customers, grows ridership and revenue, and makes transit more affordable for most price sensitive customers. On Metro Bus, this slide shows the expansion of all day frequent service improvements to three additional lines. So, I'm sorry, B2, A12, and 16M, while the docket includes a, the fourth additional line, 11Y, and the launching of the Better Bus network redesign. On Metro Rail, service would improve with trains arriving every three to six minutes at stations in the core and trains every eight to 12 minutes or better system wide, benefiting customers again across our network. Green and yellow line stations would arrive every six minutes all day with yellow line trains turning around at Mount Vernon Square Station. Orange line trains would operate every seven and a half minutes on average during peak service and every 10 minutes during off peak service. The proposed rail fare structures ranges from $2 to $6.50 for weekends weekdays and maintains a $2 late night and weekend fares. Weekday peak and off peak fare structure would be consolidated. The mileage rates would be standardized at 40 cents per mile after three miles. The rail based fare would match the bus fare at $2 all week. Metro would administer a regional low income fare program. This fair simplification offers advantages over a general across the board fair increase by growing ridership while maintaining a positive budget impact. The proposed low income fare program would provide customers enrolled in SNAP a 50% discount on trips, similar to seniors and disabled reduced fares. Now to the proposed operating budget. Metro has been able to reduce the original deficit forecast for FY24. Starting from the left, the red bar shows the original $318 million deficit down from $500 million. Over fiscal years 23 and 24, Metro projects an additional $150 million of personnel cost growth, mostly tied to labor and contract inflation. At the same time, from reduced expenses and favorable operating revenues. As a result, Metro is now looking at a $185 million budget gap for FY24 that needs to be closed based on options that have been previously discussed here. To sum up the gap closure conversation, the anticipated $184 million operating funding gap will be closed through a combination of recovering ridership, revenue from non-passenger sources, revenue from fare optimization initiatives, expense management, and increased federal formula funding for maintenance. In addition, new above base services would include the orange, green, and yellow line frequency improvements, more frequent service on the three bus routes previously mentioned and opening of the new Potomac Yard station. This table shows a comparison of FY23 to proposed FY24 budget. The total federal ARPA relief funding is budgeted at about $561 million at the bottom of the page. 
which is the remaining balance we expect to have available for use in FY24. I'll pivot to the capital budget. The FY24 um, $2.4 billion capital budget and the $14 billion FY24 through 29 CIP, which includes debt service and revenue loss from capital projects, focuses on Metro's capital investments on safety, the state of good repair, and reliability of Metro Rail, Metro Bus, and Metro Access assets. Highlights of the budget include investments in the Northern and Bladensburg to enable them to run electric vehicles, life cycle replacement on bus and paratransit vehicles, 8,000 series rail car acquisitions, rail car heavy repair and overhaul facilities. This capital improvement plan is funded by $2.4 billion of a combination of federal, state, and local um, funds and also debt funding. That concludes my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Olimide. Before we call witnesses, I'd like to explain the testimony process this evening. As I noted, we have people joining us in one of three ways, and I'll be switching between the queues during the hearing. If you're joining us via video, please keep your camera off in your mute and mute your microphone until I call on you. If you're with us in person, please come up to the podium and microphone when I call on you to speak. If you need a microphone brought to you, please raise your hand when I call your name and someone will come to you. If you're here in person and want to speak, please see staff outside at the registration table. If you're listening on the phone, you can press asterisk three to be put in the queue to speak. You'll get a notification when it's your turn to speak. If you're watching this hearing live and decide you want to provide testimony, you can call in at 855 925 2801. After calling in, Enter meeting code 7756. Once you're in the meeting, you will be able to listen over the phone by pressing asterisk one. If you would like to provide testimony and you're on the phone, you can press asterisk three and you'll be put in a speaker's queue. You'll get a message when it's your turn to speak. You can watch the hearing live online at www.wamada.com forward slash budget. And the video will be archived on the Metro Ford YouTube channel. If you're watching the live hearing on a different device, please make sure to mute the device so that there isn't feedback. You'll be able to listen to the hearing while you wait in the phone queue. For the public record to accurately reflect who's providing testimony, I'd ask that you please state your name in any organization you represent before beginning your testimony. Since this hearing is being recorded and will be available on YouTube, please do not provide any personal information like your address, phone number, or email in your testimony. Elected public officials will be allowed five minutes and everyone else will be allowed three minutes. Extra time will be given for translation if needed. We ask that you stay within your time limit because we wanna make sure everyone who wants to speak has a chance to be heard. I also want to note that each speaker is only able to speak once at each hearing while you may have the option to rejoin the speaker queue, we cannot accept additional testimony at this hearing. I wanna take a moment to recognize that this is where we listen to you. This is your opportunity to comment on the proposals 
and we are here to listen. We will not be able to answer questions during your testimony. For those of you with us in person, Metro staff is available outside of the room to answer any questions. Detailed information is also available online at wmata.com forward slash budget. Your comments will become part of the public record that will be reviewed by the Metro Board of Directors. Changes to the options presented here tonight may be proposed in response to testimony received and subsequent staff analysis. And now it's time to call our first witness. As a reminder, please tell us your name and any organization you represent before you start speaking. The first individual we have, and please forgive me if I do mispronounce your name, is Kachi Sato. Ah, thank you, Mr. Sado. Yes, please, the podium and the microphone. I better to put, uh, take off the mask here? Absolutely. Okay. I'm not accustomed to it. Anyway, how can I, okay. Hello, my name is Koichi Sado. I'm a jurisdiction in Arlington, Virginia, the United States, coming to Arlington in August 2021 from Japan. I have been living, uh, working in the DMV area. For the proposed budget plan, I would like to mention one thing about personnel cost, followed by my farewell goodbye comments to leave the United States. Uh, first of all, uh, human resources matter. Looking at the human capital summary part in the budget proposal, about 13,000 metro workers' salaries are expected to hike by only just about 4% from the 2023 budget to 2024 budget. On the other hand, board secretary, uh, which consists of four authorized personnel, is going to increase by more than 14%. If my calculation is correct from page 30, about $240,000 per personnel in the 2024 budget. Oh dear, uh, why not allocate that increase for the executive members for, to the essential workers that are eagerly supporting the Washingtonians' lives? I would like to turn my topic to my impressions on the Metro uh, budget plan. Uh, frankly speaking, uh, Metro employees are working very hard, uh, but not too overwhelmed in a good sense. To look, on my back, uh, look back on my experience in the United States, um, soon after my arriving at the US about 19 months ago, uh, to be honest, I was frustrated by the metro system in the United States. Times are not accurate. Um, comparing the live train bus map, some train buses are ghosted. All day track maintenance is conducted during the daytime, exacerbating the train service frequency. Particularly after the derailment, derailment of Kawasaki 7000 series rail cars, we have to wait long for trains. I was initially contemplating that Japanese trains were better. However, the way of thinking changed dramatically as I continue living in the States. Uh, on our way to Vienna Station on the Orange Line train, there was a train accident, but within 15 minutes' time, alternative shuttle buses are available by flexibly allocating free bus operators to additional buses. That wouldn't have been achievable if all Metro employees were too overwhelmed. In other words, Metro resilient and kind performance was possible thanks to the labor-friendly work environment or occasional shutdown period to avoid too much overworked stress for the Metro employees. Overall, Washington Metro personnel so, are so marvelous that they changed my way of thinking. Um, well, more personnel in the DMV areas are working very passionately and eagerly. I truly appreciate, appreciate their performance. So therefore, I would strongly recommend that board members appreciate the ordinary but vital uh, essential workers increase their wages, uh, allowing the atmosphere to take some break for them to regain the energy. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sato, for your comments. Now we'll call the next individual, Jonathan Ginsburg. Oh, just a little. Okay, he's not here. Cameron 
Gervin. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, thanks. My name is Cameron Gervin, and I commute most weekdays, and I'll say voluntarily, because I like being on site at work. I go from U Street to Capitol South, and I'm speaking in opposition of ending the Yellow Line service at Mount Vernon Square. Um, I know Metro is facing a tremendous budget shortfall with uh, reduced ridership and unpaid fares. So I'm appreciative of the attempt to, to try to improve the service, but for those of us who live just north of downtown um, on the green and yellow lines, we're getting reduced frequencies. Um, things are getting worse, not better. So right now I have an eight minute wait at L'Enfant Plaza at, at the worst when I'm going home. Now it could potentially be 12. And the way I see it, that, that's an unacceptable amount of time to be traveling really within the urban core. I don't see U Street as being super far out there. I, I feel like we need to have more, more frequent trains going there. I want to point out in particular, if, uh, if my understanding was correct, at one point during the pandemic, Columbia Heights was the most transited uh, station in the entire system. And so by cutting service to Columbia Heights, you're really, um, you know, t taking away transit from, from those people who need it most. Um, I see this as a, a question of equity. There, there's talk about increasing equity within the system, but by reducing service to PG County and points north, Th this plan does a disservice to those who, who really are relying on transit. It's a step backwards. Um, I also want to add, you know, personally, I, I'm privileged enough to live pretty close to downtown. I sometimes bike to work. It t generally takes me about the same amount of time to get to work as, as Metro does. But it, if I find myself having to wait at L'Enfant Plaza for a few more minutes both ways every day, it really disincentivizes that. I, I could be taking a lot more telework than I do, but I like being on site. But if it just becomes that much of a drudge to get into work, it's, it's, gonna, um, it's gonna make me think twice about it. I, I don't mean that to sound like a threat, but that's just, <laughs> I know you're not counting on just my fare. But um, anyway, it, it would really be a disappointment. Um, I, I hope that this change could be reconsidered. I wonder, I understand there are logistical challenges in, involving the turnaround, um, and so, from that regard, Mount Vernon Square, using the turnaround there is needed. I'm wondering if there could be ideas such as having one train to Mount Vernon Square, one to Fort Totten, and one to Greenbelt. Um, but all I know is what we've got now works. It's, it's not ideal, but um, if reducing service further for, for a bunch of folks is, is not an improvement. It's, it's, it's not gonna help things. So um, I really urge you to reconsider. Th thanks a lot for that. Thank you, Mr. Gervin, for your comments. Next, we'll have Carol Black. I'm sorry, I thought you were going to go back and forth from online telephone calls. But anyway, uh, my name's Carol Black. I live in Alexandria, but I commute, as the last speaker did, every day into my job at DC. I am concerned about a number of things, so I've changed around what I'm going to say today. First of all, has anyone even determined whether or not the people are going to be most impacted by the monetary increase during off-peak hours are also those who can afford to be most affected? I don't see any evidence of that, but I have not delved into this directly. First, also, the high housing cost closer inside the Beltway will necessitate that those who cannot afford to live in those places are going to live farther away from D.C., so they're going to be affected more uh, drastically than those of us who live nearby. I'm not here speaking for my own behalf. I'm lucky, I've got the senior half price pass, but I'm here to speak for those who can't speak for themselves because to have the standard to be, to have be getting federal food assistance, I don't think that's high enough. The inflation rate has affected so many more people and this increase on off-peak hours to go from 385 to 260 more, 265 more per ride, that's a lot. I think the biggest problem that Metro's got to get over is that you've got to improve safety. I've only been riding it full time since last May. Just since September, I take normally the Braddock Road. Luckily, I'm gonna be able to take the Potomac line, but the safety issues now are so scary that I can't read a magazine. I can't read a book. I've got to look around. Just in the past couple of months, just last week, 
we had to stop at McPherson Square. They said there was an authorized person outside. No, I saw a driver going through. I saw a bomb threat officer when I got off at Judiciary Square. Mr. Cunningham got killed. The poor man out in Vienna was dragged 450 feet. Did no one on that car know how to call and stop that um, driver to let him know? 450 feet is a long way to be dragged. I believe that man's death could have been avoided. I'm a lawyer, I'm not practicing in personal injury, but we need to have more communication. If you get on a plane, they announce what's happening. You can just look and see, where do I go? Where do I hit that button? On the older cars, if you look in the middle where you pull up for the door, you've got a grounding wire attached to where screws have been put in. I don't even know if I would be allowed to open that door. Did somebody get shot beforehand? Please think about these things. I also think you've got a procurement problem. These cars that you bought years past with these wheels, a problem, the elevate, excuse me, the escalators, I don't know who's buying those, but somebody needs to go back and look. At Braddock Road, where I take, those are brand new, and they're constantly being serviced. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Black. Next, we'll hear from Mike Golash. Uh, my name is Mike Golash. I'm a DC resident in Ward 4, and I'm a fairly constant rider of Metro bus and Metro rail. The first thing is I want to talk about Metro's finances. Metro has, to, any increase in fares is unnecessary and to, leads to a decreased ridership, and our effort should be to minimize fares as much as possible. What are sources of additional fare revenue? One is Metro creates a tremendous amount of value for buildings and businesses within the vicinity of its stations. They should be taxed at higher rates than they currently are to try and recapture some of that value we create for them. Second of all, the federal government provides passes for its federal employees to ride the transit system. They encourage federal employees to, pay, to ride the system. Maybe the fare is $4 for a ride, but the true cost of that fare is more like $8. So the federal government should make up for operating expenses the differences between what is paid through fares to operate the system, to ride the system, and what the true cost of that ride is. I think that will help generate more revenue, allow more, lower fares overall, and encourage ridership. The second thing is I'm, I'm concerned about is the safety on the rail. I've heard recently that Metro is, is planning on returning to ATO operations. The problem with ATO operations is it takes away from the train operator any control over when the train stops. No train should be going faster than the stopping distance the driver can see. That's what happened in the accident that occurred in 2009. The operator could not see around the corner and understand, so as the train approached the, the turn, and the signaling was not working properly, the train was going too fast to stop. So the idea of to maintain a safe system, whether it's an ATO or manually, the train should never go faster than an operator can see where he's gonna be stopping. So he can notice whether or not there's a, a passenger, a vehicle, some sort of obstruction, which he conceivably co collide with. Um, the second thing is, I'm con the last thing I'm concerned about in terms of uh, revenue, and we've made a lot about we want to treat our employees better. One of the big issues has been the retiree health insurance issue. Everyone hired by Metro after 2010 into a bargaining unit position will not have retiree health insurance. That's a big disincentive for people to make this a career. The Transit Authority in conjunction with the union should begin to pre-fund that benefit. By doing, by pre-funding it, they can reduce the long-term cost of that benefit. We've, that's been discussed with the previous general manager, with the previous chief financial officer. They're interested, but nothing has come of those discussions. We should re-intensify our efforts to accomplish that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Golosh, for your comments. Our next speaker is Paul Semelfort. Hi. 
Hello, my name is Paul Sommelfort, and I'm a member of the um, Accessibility Advisory Committee, and I'm speaking as an individual tonight, and I am from Prince George's County, Maryland. So some of the things um, I'm gonna talk about is number one, um, we're asking to simplify fares for all transit modes, especially Metro Access or paratransit, for which is currently the most complex and inconsistent. A simple fix would be to extend the current flat fare that um, is on weekends and after 9.30 p.m. to 24 um, hours, seven days a week is one suggestion. Number two, extend this, um, discounted fares on all transit modes to um, all low-income people, not just those receiving SNAP benefits. This might include, but not limited to, Metro Access riders receiving um, SSI and or SSDI benefits. And just to note as an example, um, in New York City, um, with their paratransit with Accessor Ride, um, they do um, go extend the fair affairs program, which is similar to that, where you know qualified individuals with low income um, are you know able to pay half that paratransit fare. So I would strongly um, cons um, you know suggest Metro you know investigate that and consider um, that path um, of offering. Also, please keep the proposed equity and accessibility enhancement plans. Please continue the Better Bus Project, enhancing surface routes and service. Please include accessible bus stops, replacing those that do not currently meet accessibility standards, including curb cuts, signage, and shelters. Floating bus stops um, must provide safety for low vision, low hearing, and low mobility passengers, as well as others. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Um, Semaphore, for those comments. Um, we're now gonna segue to our virtual um, speakers. The first person is Eric Scheinkoff. Uh, thank you very much. I really appreciate you got the name, it's not easy. Uh, again, as I said, my name's Eric Scheinkoff. I live uh, right by the North Bethesda Metro stop, uh, North Bethesda White Flint stop. I often, I, can, uh, I often go for entertainment and Pink Quarter, uh, Archive Stop or Kennedy Center, uh, Blue or Orange Line, and I also work uh, uh, virtually with telework, but uh, when I do go in, I work in Crystal City uh, or in other parts of Virginia. So what I'm proposing is that from at Farragut North is for, to Farragut West is maybe they, is they could put together or construct a, a walking tunnel underground under Farragut Square to ease the uh, transition, make it faster commute for you, uh, coming and going, and also ease the pressure on the choke point at Metro Center. You don't, you won't go outside if the weather is poor, uh, and a lot of people just won't think about it. I don't need any kind of walking, uh, moving people movers, just just a tunnel. And the same thing at Archives Gallery Place. Oftentimes you get off a of Gallery Place and then you want to walk, then you wait for the yellow line to go back down to Archives or the reverse, and for one stop, you could miss the connection, and it, again, it would speed up your connection, and it would speed up the time, and again, ease the pressure at the choke point of uh, Gallery Place. So I don't know if these are things are possible to consider. Uh, I remember years ago, Dr. Gridlock in the Washington Post had mentioned it uh, after I had written an article then. Maybe it's something to think about as an improvement. It wouldn't, as I said, especially the uh, one at Farragut, under Farragut Square. And again, I thank you for, uh, thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Shankoff, for those comments. Next, we also have our next virtual speaker, Phil Posner. Good evening. Uh, I'm Phil Posner. I am a resident of Arlington, Virginia, and I represent all my brothers and sisters in the disability community with cognitive speech, vision, hearing, and mobility issues. And I'll just say amen to what Mr. Simmelford said to save some of my three minutes for more important things. Uh, one of my biggest things is simplifying fares, which is a board project. I live across the street from Virginia Square Metro, orange and silver, few stops, from Ross Lynn, Blue Line. I live down the street from the 41, 42, and 40. So I can travel on three rail lines and on three bus lines. 
very easily. The problem is metro access fare is calculated as the fastest route that you want to go. But there's no way to know from day to day, minute to minute, hour to hour. There are over 200,000 iterations of the fares. Even when all of the construction is not going on, even when all the accidents are not going on. So if I want to go to Pentagon City, I can go by bus. I can go by orange, silver, blue, and I don't know. So I can pay $4 one way, $7 the other way, the same day on any given day of the week. That's why we say it's so complicated. People come to the AAC every time we have a meeting and complain about not knowing what their fare is. The other point to make is the board members should really talk to Dr. Helfer <laughs> because Arlington has the star system. And I know exactly what I'm paying on star at any place I go because it's a flat fare within Arlington County. It's an extra dollar to go across the river to the district. It's a little more to go out to Silver Spring or Prince George County or whatever. And it's the same morning, noon, night, every day of the week. So please make it simple. 24-7 uh, flat fare. Pick a number between zero and $6 and we'll love you for it. The extended discount fares in all modes to low income people is great, but it should be more than people on SNAP. In addition to that, people that ride Metro Access all have a disability. And some like me are old and have a disability. And my fare isn't calculated as twice my senior system disability. It's calculated as twice the full fare. Boy, that doesn't sound fair. But I heard the buzzer go off, so I've obviously hit the three minute mark. So yes. thank you all so much. And seeing Lucinda smile tonight has made my entire evening. Thank you, Deputy Mayor Babers. <laughs> Thanks, Mr. Posner, for those comments. Thank you. Next, we go back to in person. Oh, we're going to go to the phone. So we are trying to mix it up, Ms. Black. We're going to the phone, so I'm going to um, unmute caller 9388. You'll be um, notified when you can start speaking. And I originally had planned to be in person, so you can remove my name from that queue because I, I am was not able to make it in person. Um, I live in Rockville, Maryland, and I am a blind person who uses the system, the bus and rail generally. Um, I am president of the Sawyer Creek chapter of the National Federation of Blind of Maryland. And I am in agreement with the simplifying the fare structure on uh, for everybody, but certainly Metro access as well. That is, um, people cannot budget at all when you have no idea what your fare is going to be. And I, I think our fares for paratransit are certainly close to the highest in the nation and certainly the most bizarre. Um, I don't know, for some reason, people in other cities that are just as large as Washington DC can, uh, get cheaper service. And, um, I'm not sure that it's any worse than, uh, what we, have here, so I certainly think that uh, that a minimum that a permanent fare of four dollars is is certainly a thing that that should be able to happen for metro access. Um, I am a person who uses the green line every day, and um, it's full. Um, I don't know why we want to cut service there because I I know that those trains are crowded, and, and I I think. Um, I, I do get on at Fort Totten heading toward downtown, and that train is crowded. Um, so I don't think we ought to be cutting that. Um, also, that for the wayfinding stuff, I'm a person who does not use a smartphone. Um, and if we're going to use an app for a service, I don't want us to, I want us to put some more energy into other kinds of um, uh, system wide information, more Braille signage, more. Um, on the bus stops containing information about about um, buses, um, 
that's coming up. And so I don't want us to compromise on other um, accessible wayfinding information. Thank you. Thank you. And for the record, can you say your name again? We, we didn't get it the first time. I'm Deborah Brown from Maryland. Thank you, Ms. Brown. Our next caller, phone number ending in 6061. Good evening. My name is Alicia Lillian, and I've been a longtime resident of Northern Virginia, and I have I've, um, rode both the bus and the train for many years. And in the years that I have um, ridden the train, I've seen the safety go down. I've seen a lot go down. People um, trying to collect money because, I guess, the poor, they don't have enough, or maybe for drugs, I don't know, but it's insecure, and plus, with all those um, killings and uh, um, people being robbed and everything else at the bus stops and at the train stops, it's very dangerous. So they need to put more Metro police out there and on the trains for the people's safety. Secondly, um, as far as the buses, um, I, I ride 29G or 17M in the mornings, and there's two rates. One is for 225 and one is for 425. Where I get on, it's the same ride as the 29G, but with the 17M, it's $2 more per day. And I don't know why it's, it's why it's more when they're both going the same route and taking the express into the Pentagon in D.C., in Northern Virginia, rather. So I'd like to see that be that to be corrected. And as you all talked about getting, have a consistency with the, with the um costs of the buses and the trains as you're talking about consolidation and I really hope you all do that because it really needs to help and I know people that I know that were taking bus and train they've stopped taking it and they're driving themselves because the buses are not reliable especially the 29G there are even um, signs at the Pentagon where they don't have any drivers for the 29G and I think that's pretty sad for as much money as we're spending each day and so if you all could seriously consider what I've just mentioned, I'd really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Logan, for those comments. So now we're going to go back to in-person. Margaret Dyer. Good evening. My name is Margaret Dwyer, and I'm here tonight speaking on behalf of Ward 3 Housing Justice, a grassroots advocacy uh, group working for affordable housing and economic opportunity in Ward 3. I'm also a neighbor of the Western Bus Garage and the Lord and Taylor site. And I just want to, off the record, not in my written testimony, say that I love going by the site every day and uh, being greeted by the bus drivers there. They're the friendliest folks in the neighborhood. My comments tonight are related to page 226 in the WMATA budget document, where 520.2 million is allocated for the Western Bus Garage replacement project. We've been disappointed in the past by WMATA not involving the surrounding community in meaningful planning prior to taking action. But tonight, we're hoping to seize this moment to begin to partner with you to ensure that the commitments both to a world-class transportation facility and affordable housing come to fruition in Friendship Heights. We celebrate WMATA's 2021 commitment to create 1,000 affordable units at metro stations, and we are heartened by the ending note in the recent WMATA community meeting at Tenley Library, where there was a call for building a world-class all-electric bus garage with other possibilities for the community in Friendship Heights. World class is a tall order, however, and we believe that to reach it, we need a world class planning process. We're calling for what, a model that we've called two sites, one plan, as the model for the redevelopment of both the current bus garage site and the Lord and Taylor site. In other words, we wanna see a partnership among DEMPED, DHCD, the Office of Planning, WMATA, and other stakeholders, specifically including our affiliated nonprofit Northwest Opportunity Partners Community Development Corporation, the only community development corporation focused 
on equitable development in Ward 3, as well as other stakeholders, to plan both of these major important sites at once with a coordinated overarching vision. And we want that vision to include outcomes like contributing to Mayor Bowser's goal for 1,990 units of new affordable housing in Ward 3. We want the sites to be beautiful and environmentally respectful. We want to meet the needs of WMATA. We want to contribute new life and vibrancy to Friendship Heights. But we see that the budget document on page 226 includes little detail beyond a bottom line. And we urge that generous funding be allocated within this budget to set a new standard of coordinated and collaborative planning driven by a beautiful, overarching, coherent vision. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Dreyer, for, um, for those comments. Our next in-person speaker is Zur Zuri Lee. Good afternoon. I'm Zuri Lee, and I'm a resident of the Prince George's County, also a student at the University of Maryland. So today my comments are concerning the plan of turning around the yellow line at the Mountain Vernon Station. The yellow line has been an essential part of my commute and that of many other Maryland residents. Terminating it at the Mountain Vernon Square Station would create an inconvenience for commuters traveling to and from northern Prince George's County, in particular those commuting before, between their homes to the National Airport or to the Crystal City commercial area in Virginia. Many residential areas in Prince George's counties are built near the Greenbelt, College Park, and Houseville crossing stations. The proposal enforces us an additional transfer to the Green Line each trip, adding time and complexity to an already long commute, especially to and from the National Airport. Also, the proposed changes aim for a more frequent service. However, for people traveling to and from stations north of Mount Vernon Square, the new proposal provides Green Line trains at a frequency of every six minutes, where previously we had green and yellow lines each at every 12 minutes. So there is essentially no change to the service frequency. In fact, even the late night service frequency might reduce based on the proposal. Moreover, as a student of the University of Maryland, lots of us rely on metro train services. Maryland has more than 40,000 students and the university runs a frequent and free shuttle between the campus and the College Park Metro Station. Based on the website, the average daily customer count for the College Park Metro Station is about 1.5 thousand post-pandemic, and the number is almost 4,000 before the pandemic. Commuting via yellow line between Virginia and the University of Maryland is clearly a preferred way due to no traffic jams on the roadways and its affordable prices. It is very inconvenient or even discourage students from riding the metro if the yellow line stops serving the College Park Station. In conclusion, I would like the metro directors to reconsider the proposal to turn around the yellow line at Mount Vernon Square Station. Note that I am indeed in favor of a more frequent green and yellow line service, but I believe there will be better ways to achieve this goal other than turning around the yellow line at Mount Vernon Square. For example, we can maybe run each line at every eight minutes instead of six minutes, or making the yellow line travel between Huntington and Mount Vernon Square with every other train continuing to the Greenbelt Station. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Mr. Lee, for those comments. If anyone else has joined us on the phone and you want to be added to the speaker's queue, please press asterisk three on your phone. Oh, or star three. It's an asterisk. Okay, star or star three. Okay, next we have in person Ansel Torres. Someone's coming. Hello, good evening. Uh, my name is Ansel Torres. I am totally blind. I live in Silver Spring, Maryland. 
I run the Torres Foundation for the Blind, where I run a blog called Metro Access Watch. My comments today are going to focus primarily on, actually exclusively, on Metro Access. Um, I am very angry and upset with the way money is being allocated at WMATA. There's a budget variance of $43 million that's in the Metro Access budget for fiscal year 2022, the last year that we have actuals. Okay? Uh, $164 million were allocated to provide paratransit service. $121 million were actually used. So there's a budget variance of $43 million. I have asked to find out where is that $43 million that was not used, where was it uh, dispersed? What was it spent on? It certainly was not spent on Metro Access and improving the service. Because as to today, we still have a situation where Metro Access riders do not have an app to find out where their vehicles are. That does not cost $43 million. That is a fraction of $43 million. Rail and buses at WMATA have a GPS system, and they've had it for a long time to track those vehicles. Why is it that we don't have it? Accessibility standards on the Metro Access WMATA website are low. It's very hard to find the booking app on the home page. I had to beg for several years to even get a link placed there. And if you use the H navigation, the blind folks in the audience will know what I'm talking about, to easily find the link, it, it's not there. You can find information about tourism and all of this other stuff, but nothing about the, the Metro Access booking app. I am very, very, very upset about this. The advertising budget, the advertising budget for Metro Access is a measly $34,000. It's millions of dollars for bus, Metro Bus and Metro Rail. That is wrong. Metro Access riders, when they have to pay pa to ride paratransit, they're paying the highest fare in the country. That $43 million can be used to reduce these burdensome high fares that cost people on limited incomes, on, on fixed incomes, 2% just to take a ride from Maryland to Washington, D.C. 2% of their monthly income just to take one one-way ride into Washington, D.C. That is unfair, it is unconscionable, and Metro Access needs to answer for it. I, was, I did ask those questions. I was told by Mr. Blake at WMATA, at, uh, who is head honcho of Metro Access, and access services, that he was not going to provide the information. I demand here this evening to get an accounting for where the excess funds that are being used on Metro, that are supposed to be used on Metro Access, where is it going? While all of, of uh, so many of our needs are not being met, it is wrong. And in honor of Judy Human, who died sa on Saturday, Judy Human, for those of you who don't know, is the mother of the disability movement in the United States. I'm very proud of her, and I stand here in her honor this evening. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Torres, for those comments. The next in-person um, individual is Caleb Barber. Hey guys, so I, my name is uh, Caleb Barber, and uh, don't want to necessarily beat the dead horse over the yellow line being terminated at uh, Mount Vernon, but I have an idea that could possibly be under consideration as an alternative. So kind of the current situation is with the new, kind of with, with the new um, 
headways, it would be about 20 trains per hour at Greenbelt, which is apparently kind of too much for it to handle because it only has the two tracks. Sometime in the future, would it, like, would it be a possibility to kind of build like a third track or something like a pocket track that will go in, kind of inside in between the two or something? So it's a, so kind of simulate kind of what's going on at Mount Vernon so you're easily able to turn around those trains. And kind of in the meantime is that would take, that would take more time than when this fiscal year comes into play. And so maybe instead of, instead of cutting, cutting the yellow line service from Mount Vernon, can have it so like some will like like every other one would kind of would go all the way up to Greenbelt while one would kind of stop at Mount Vernon. So that would be every si every six minutes you'd get a green, and then every twelve. So kind of ideally that would be wait times of either three or six minutes between each train. Oh, and that is all I have today. Thank you, Mr. Barber, for those comments. Next, we have Carl Raven. Hello, and actually my name is Carl Rabin, and I've been riding the Metro since, um, well, March 27th, 1976, when they first had the first trains come out. Anyway, I come to the Smithsonian. You can see I've got everything on. I work as a volunteer now that I'm retired, three days a week at Smithsonian Museums, and I've been riding the trains for whatever that is, 45 years. Anyway, I have three, four small opinions. Let me just get to them. Um, one is, again, about the yellow line. Right now, people don't seem to be complaining, and the green line, which is running double it, its previous service, is running about every seven minutes or so. So if the green line ran every six minutes and the yellow line ran every six minutes, that's three minutes in downtown, and the first person, or the people who've talked said, Waiting eight or 10 minutes is no good. You didn't say it's waiting eight or 10 minutes. You said waiting six. It sounds perfectly reasonable to me. Maybe after 9.30, the yellow line, and you know, but even that 10 minute service after 9.30 on the green line only is perfectly fine. I don't think anybody realized they've doubled the frequency of the green line over the last, you know, when they started fixing the yellow line bridge. The next, and um, let's see, the next one would be, um, oh, the thing that I do have a problem with, I gotta go quickly, the yellow line problem is, if the yellow line's gonna run in Virginia every six minutes, but the blue line's gonna run every eight minutes or 10 minutes, very often, I mean, maybe it's seven and a half they're thinking, it's never eight, it's always seven and a half, so you can fit in eight trains per hour. I think what they're, the problem will be, if it's running every six minutes, sometimes a blue line train There'll be two yellow lines and then a blue line train one minute behind it and everything gets stopped up. Or there'll be a blue line train and the yellow line train is right behind it. Normally trains that share the same track have to same the same share, have the same frequency so they can be shared and alternate all the time. Like the yellow and green line going to Mount Vernon Square, the yellow going to Mount Vernon Square. So that's the only problem I seem to have with making the blue line a lot less frequent. And you're gonna have that same problem with the orange line being real frequent, and the silver line, which I have seen hardly anybody rides, not being that frequent. At first, I was worried about the prices being too high, 40 cents per mile, but I also realized you'll hit that 650 point at 16 miles. And I don't think any line goes out 16 miles from downtown, except for the silver line, and it's so far out, I don't know why they don't charge $8 to go out to um, Loudoun County but that's just my opinion about the prices. You could charge an extra dollar for leaving Dulles Airport. Final last thing, I hope the miles are computed the way they, they were years ago. I think they still are. It's the miles on the train plus the, as the crow flies mile, mileage divided by two. It's the average of those two numbers. I would hope you would do that again. So someone going from Silver Spring to Friendship Heights wouldn't have to pay so much and the last thing is, buses overnight on Connecticut Avenue and Rhode Island Avenue would be great. I already spoke to someone and they said they hope to do that someday, overnight. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Raven, for those comments. Attention in the audience, please, if you're on the phone, I need you to take that call outside out of respect of the other Thank you. Our next 
speaker is Scott Brannon. Good evening. Hope you guys are enjoying this as much as I am. My name is Scott Brand. I live in Arlington, Virginia. I brought a little memento. Community Resources, a nonprofit I work with. Special thanks to Randy Clark, Womata Chair, Nomada CEO. <laughs> I um, work with uh, some bears in the community. We're just getting going. Like at a hospital, like emergency room. I was thinking maybe I had the Metro Bear. And um, my wife was a long time member. Uh, she would ride use Metro Access all the time. She passed out away last year. My wife died last year. Um, what I have is this. It's called a virtual trademark of the name Public Archery Signs. And basically, we were wondering about maybe a pilot project. You know, there's a lot of different ways that Metro um, utilizes, you know, the big screen TVs and all that. We were wondering if we can try a pilot project to put a couple of these on the pole themselves with virtual trademark, public art three signs, the art, like the National Gallery, we can use art and sponsorship. And the last part is that it, our idea was called the 10% factor. Okay, what I mean by that is um, with this idea that I have a sponsors, you know, one of space on bus falls, we wanted to take 10% uh, from my nonprofit community resources and 90% could go to Metro Access. Kaylin was a member of Metro Access now. We have the Kaylin Braggs and Memorial Fund. So 90% could go to Metro Access. Or I know that I've heard the Metro would be interested maybe in the Capital Area Food Bank. I know it's an awful lot to, you know, to try to grasp how putting these little signs on poles, but I think it could be good. I'm, I, I'm gonna ask some people out here. I'm gonna drop off a beer for Mr. Mr. Clark and I have the next one too, but I'm thankful to be here today. I've been looking forward to it all day, and I love the Metro, you know, and I'll, I'll close with one thing. Um, about a year, I was approached by um, the Metro police officers, and they said they wanted to have a word with me. That's sort of shocking, I know, but let me tell you the rest of the story. They said that they uh, had caught me, me on video. I said, really? They said that there was a young lady, and it showed a guy that was accosting her and being verbally and on a, not physically, but verbally abusive to her. And the, she, he said the video showed I brought her to the station manager and did, you know, made her safe and everything. That was the highlight of my day when the Metro Police told me that. So free bears, free bears for all the kids. Thanks for letting me share, Scott Brandon. I wanna ask those guys, how, you know, how, who do I write or follow up on stuff like this? But that's the public art street sign, teddy bear. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Brennan, for those comments. Next, we have Daryl Bowman. Oh, good evening. Oh, my name is Daryl Bowman. Okay. I'm homeless. I've been homeless since uh, 1982. I've been catching Metro since 1982. And I've been working at East River Murray Hotel downtown, and I retired now. And, that, and every time I catch the bus, or the bus, or some buses don't stop. They keep on seeing me at the bus stop, or they go, uh, or keep on going see me at the, or they gonna keep on going see me at the bus stop. Oh, that's not right. It's not, it's not right one bit. See me at the bus stop. Gonna keep on going. And I'm a taxpayer. I'm a taxpayer. I pay my taxes. Something needs to be done about this. The bus don't stop at the bus stop. Okay. Next, next month, next month I'm about to give me a job. Next month I'm about to give me a job at Dallas Airport. Uh, I got a, I got an interview next month at ten o'clock in the morning. Okay, I guess the, I guess the, uh, I think the yellow line not running. Is the yellow line running? I think it's not running. Or the yellow line. Not... Okay, sometimes I catch the green line and the blue line and the silver line. Yeah. 
in our budget, and the budget is sure. But what y'all do with the money y'all give for Metro? What y'all do with the money y'all give for Metro? I see y'all buy brand new buses, brand new police cars, and can't stop crime. It's getting, it's getting crazy out here. It's getting crazy. People die every day. People go to jail. It's not right. What are y'all going to do about this? Is y'all going to talk to me? Um, Mr. Bowman, we can't respond to questions during this hearing. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you for your comments. Next, we have David Burke. Good evening, everybody. My name is David Burke. I've been a board, board recipient for all my life. I'm here to propose about the yellow line changes going from Greenbelt to Huntington. And I'm not too happy about cutting back to Mount Vernon Square. At the last um, speaker about he was in with in uh, Prince George County, Maryland, I also take the yellow line myself too from the new Hinesville Crossing every day from Hinesville Crossing to Fort Chatham Metro. And also, I'm not too happy about the changes. I see, I like to, I like to, I like to hit all lines to remain the same between both Greenbelt and Huntington, along with the uh, Greenbelt to Branch Avenue at a six minute Hayward. That way you can have both, both lines running at the same time. You can have a choice either going to Greenbelt to, to Huntington or to Branch Avenue. So you can have both lines and both people can go to either the Branch Avenue or Huntington by way of National Airport. And that way you can, that way have a six minute headway in both places. Now if you wanna come back to, to uh, Mount Vernon Square, you can do that on rush hour only. After rush hour, take it back up to uh, Greenbelt. And then on weekends, have both places going up to, uh, to Greenbelt. And then also, uh, when you go back to uh, midnight, have them both go up to Greenbelt. And in conclusion, this is a, this is a bad way to have the yellow line going back up to uh, what, to Mount Vernon Square. Uh, and that way, if you do that, it'd be bad for uh, for customers. Take it back on both both directions to Greenbelt and Huntington. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Burke, for those comments. So we do not appear to have anyone else in the audience who have registered to speak, nor is anyone on the phone or virtual. So at this point, that was our last speaker. This hearing is now concluded. You're welcome to submit additional written testimony. It must be received by 5 p.m. on Wednesday, March the 15th. Testimony can be submitted online at wmata.com forward slash budget. Online, you have the option to complete a survey, write free form comments, and upload a letter, petition, or other document. You can also mail testimony to the Office of the Secretary, wmata, s.e.c.t. 2E PO Box 44390, Washington, D.C. 20026-4390. Again, all testimony must be received by 5 p.m. on March 15th. We encourage everyone to submit comments online if possible. You also have the option to speak at other hearings we're holding on the budget this week. Tomorrow evening at Metro's New Carrollton offices at 4100 Garden City Drive at 6 p.m. This location is conveniently located near the New Carrollton Metro Station. Also on Wednesday evening at M Muradin High School 121 Mustang Alley in Falls Church. Metro will be providing a 
shuttle from the West Falls Church Metro Station. And then we're also going to have an opportunity for a virtual hearing we're holding on Friday, March the 10th at noon. Friday's hearing will only accept comments via phone or video. I'm being told that there is one more speaker in the audience. So at this moment, let me call up Truett Prosper. I just have one thing, <clears throat> and that's, uh, would you consider running some type of bus on Missouri Avenue North? West between North Capitol and Georgia Avenue. That's a straight shot. A bus line on that route would be accessible to cross buses to Georgia Avenue 70, 79, and the North Capitol e bus. 64, 60, that stretch, Missouri Avenue between North Capitol and Georgia Avenue, if you would consider. And I, I'm sure you would get ample ridership. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Prosper, for those comments. To get back to my closing remarks, information on how to register for the remaining hearings can be found at www.wamada.com forward slash budget. Thank you again for joining us and for taking the time to provide testimony. Have a very good evening.